Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the Spooktacular. Uh, I hope you're all there. I hope people can start seeing me and stuff. Uh, it's Queeve here. How are you? Uh, in my in my new office. Oh, this is the first time I've been live in the new office. Hello, this is the, this is the new office. Um, I'm going to just be uh, doing a bit of casual chitting and chatting. Hello, John O'Brien. Uh, that's a very Irish name, sir. I mean, Sean is to be fair, slightly more Irish, but uh, it's pretty Irish. Um, some YouTube, I can see all the YouTube people, all the Facebook people coming in now as well. Jan, how are you? Uh, you're all very welcome to, uh, this is very much the 2.0 of the uh, the Queeve, uh, the Batcave. Um, and uh, Caroline Blackford, nice to see you. Everyone's coming in. George Petty, how are you, love? Lovely to see you. Ah, everyone's coming in. Hello, hello, hello. Do say hello if you're there. It's always love to see you. And... Uh, yeah, we're very, very excited. Uh, I'm doing the uh, the live reading tonight, uh, which I've been practicing. I'm not going to lie to you, did a practice today, absolutely nailed it. I uh, did a practice an hour ago. I was terrible. Like, I was basically looked like a man who just learned English, never mind re reading stuff out loud. Um, so uh, it, it could go one way or the other. That's all I'll say to you. It could go either way. Uh, we're very excited. Um, hello to you all. Everyone's coming in. It's great to see some uh, some old and some new faces. Hello from the new forest. Yeah, I do say where you are, folks, as well. It's always cool to see where everyone's coming from. Um, you're very welcome. It's good. I don't know. I hope it's the weather here is uh, weirdly the the the, sh the short story starts on it was a dark and stormy night and um, Washington State. How are you, Charlotte? Lovely to see you all. Um, but uh, God, it's miserable outside in, in Manchester at the minute. I know it's a cliche about the rain and stuff, but the whole of Britain's been pretty awful for the last couple of weeks, to be fair. And I think it's going to be for the next week. And Ireland, God love them. They're south of Ireland in particular. It's had a lot of flooding. So I hope you're all... Slovakia. Ooh, you're, you're, that's, that's the leader in the clubhouse for uh, Unusual. Well done, Rob. Nice to see you there. Uh, English woman living in Spain. Stacey, how are you? And uh, oh, Paul's there. How are you, Paul? Uh, uh, love to see you. He's our wonderful engineer, and uh, he does all the audio books. Uh, him and Brendan, we will have on. Brendan McDonald's going to be on uh, in a few minutes' time. Me and him, Brendan, be having a chat. And uh, Stroud. Ah, uh, now we're talking glamorous. Texas. How are you, Liverpool? I was actually in Liverpool. Uh, oh, hey, car. I was in Liverpool um, last Friday. I was signing books. Actually, bizarrely, I was in signing books. Just quickly nipping in because I'm not like it isn't a, an event. It's just me running in and signing stuff. Um, and bizarrely, a guy was in there who was picking up my book, and he was delighted. It was great. We got to sign it for him and stuff, which was cool. Uh, hello from Sale. Uh, how are you? I'm guessing you're having the same weather I'm having. It's only five minutes down the road. Although weirdly, uh, we have noticed this. We we live now sort of on the border of Manchester, but it's still kind of Manchester. But because we're on basically the side of a hill where we are now, and. Uh, First off, oh my God, the amount. Basically, I was getting the weather forecast for the nearest area to us from Apple. And it kept, myself and Taylor kept going out for walks and getting soaked in the local massive park just over the road. Um, and it's because we're, we're up a hill and you wouldn't believe how much more rain you get. I honestly had no idea of this. And oh my God, you get absolutely drenched. Um, at Leak Slip, how are you? Aberystwyth, uh, Newcastle upon Tyne. Lovely. I always love that part of the world. Bolton, I'm actually I'm actually signing books in Bolton. I think tomorrow. Uh, I'll say this later on, but I'm doing like a doing the last tour of like Leeds, Sheffield, uh, Barnsley, Bolton, Preston, and I think I'm possibly going to try and nip into Oldham Vacan as well. North Carolina, um, Boston, Massachusetts. I tell you, we've, it's been raining here since yesterday. Actually, God, there was quite a bit of bad weather actually in America this weekend as well. The NFL games, I know, had a lot of things. I didn't see them because I was out seeing a fantastic show last night. Uh, Foil Arms and Hog, the Irish sketch trio, if you get a chance to see them. I've shared their videos before. They're brilliant. Uh, we sit myself and, and Wonder Wife went to see them before. Myself and my mate went to see them last night. And uh, they were spectacular. But, um, oh, wow, we've loads of people in. This is fantastic to see. Great to see you all. Darkest Woking. Oh, my God. None of it's particularly bright, but Jesus, the dark part. Um, Greenock in Scotland. By the way, we did. I, I will mention this again later on, actually. Do you know what? We should probably just start. I think everyone's mo most people. We've got loads of people coming in, but I think we should probably because this isn't the start of it. This is just me saying this is me working the crowd, uh, doing the crowd work. It's all coming back to me. Um, so I think we're going to properly start the thing now. Uh, oh, yeah, Leeds, yes. Oh, yes. Definitely come to Leeds again. And uh, Sheffield, I'm also nipping in there to sign some books tomorrow. I was asking them about an event, actually. So hopefully, fingers crossed, you might get one there at some point as well. Right. I'm going to properly start the show now. So, uh, Wonder Wife, I assume you're still there. Um, if you want, oh, there she is. 
you're muted, love. I mean, big jazz hands, but you're also muted. Uh... <laughs> That's the only time you get me to be quiet if I mute myself. <laughs> uh, John, yes, we are hoping to. Right, do you want to? Shall we properly start the thing now? Do you want to do the music and all that? Oh, I've done the music when you came in. So oh, I thought you were going to do the music because because how are we going to know when it's properly it started? Is, between like, you this think is the we'd pre-show. Was it this by now? But yeah, no, yeah. If anything, it's getting more shows. Is written by my mate Alan McGuire, if I remember rightly. Um, I think, hello, ladies and gentlemen. I <laughs> didn't know. We were trying to go for a professional start. It already hasn't worked. Hello, very, you're very welcome to uh, the very first possibly annual spooktacular. Uh, please clap and cheer wherever you are. Um, but yes, what's happening tonight, ladies and gentlemen? I'm Queeve slash CK. You're all very welcome. If you've not been to one of our live things before, uh, that over there, or is that there? There you go. That's Wonderwife, a.k.a. Elaine. Um, say hello to the people, love. Hello, lovely to have you all here, and thank you for joining us. Indeed, she she she's properly polished. She can she should be like a, a, a DJ or you know one of them fancy jobs. Um, but yes, we're going to have uh, Brendan's going to be on Brendan McDonald, the narrator for the audiobooks. Uh, we're going to be a crack with him. He's now officially famous. We'll be discussing that. He's quite the sex symbol. Um, oh, he's all over the place. You can't move an iron for seeing Brendan now. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so Brendan's going to be on, we're having a chat with him, and we're going to be exciting, announcing some very exciting stuff about the new release. The cover has been officially revealed today. You can, it's hard to figure out where to point. It's, 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 where is it? There? Is it? No, hang on. There, there it is. Look, I'm assuming they can see. Yeah, a couple of, oh, is it? Oh, God. Oh, God. I was even more confused. Oh, it's up there. Uh, but you can see the thing. It's, it's a cracking cover. They've done a brilliant job. Um, we will actually do a video at some point about the covers, because for anyone who's got the hardback books and stuff, particularly, well, you can see them on the paperbacks as well, but the hardbacks are particularly good for it. Uh, what's amazing is that the cover designer, who's, who's brilliant, uh, she's a fan of the books, and she puts in all these details, really very well hidden, some of them, uh, that are all to do with the story and stuff, and they're amazing. Because, like, literally, I'm looking at one of the book covers six months later and going, oh, my God, look at this thing! And it's, it's, uh, so she does a fantastic job on them. So they're really cool book covers. We're very proud of those. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, uh, oh yes, tonight, seeing as you're all uh, here, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to celebrate you all being here, this if you're watching this, by the way, on the recording, if you're not here live, this bit doesn't apply to you, sorry, that's why you have to you know, try and be here live, but for those who are here live, uh, you can win yourself a proof copy of Relight My Fire, the book that's out at the end of January, you can get it right bloody now, oh, she's got one as well, um, so yeah, you can basically get one of these, and she, I think well, you froze there. Looking by the way, looking that's basically what we had. Um, but yes, you can win this. All you have to do is she's going to put it in the comments now. I'm sure, uh, but email Elaine at mcforey.com. Is that correct? That is correct. That's, there you go. There you go. Just email that right now, and then Elaine will put your name in the post. Make do it as quick as you can, and uh, when you do that, she'll draw. We'll draw a name at the end, and they will win themselves. A proof of this that we shall stick in the post in the next couple of days. Uh, I'll even yeah. sign it for you. Uh, Diller will have a go at licking it for you, everyone. If you can attack my inbox now, because we're going to close it at 6.30 so I can put everybody's name into a prize draw and do it at the end of this evening. Fabulous. Okie dokie. So yeah, do that just, right now. Just in case, if anybody's wondering on the email address, that is two eyes. It's M-C-F-O-R-I-I-N-K. Dot com McFory yeah, it's McForyInc.com or oh, McFory Inc. Oh, one word. Okay, love. Uh, I'll let you go. So I think your 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 uh, our Wi-Fi in the house is going a bit dodgy because you keep freezing. So uh we shall let you and it's just on oh, my big massive face. Hello. Um so again, thank you all for coming. Uh, as I said, we've officially uh launching the cover of this bad boy. I'll, I'll move that in there. You can look at that. Fabulous. Um, very excited. By the way, I don't know if you saw, I've also I've been out uh Love Will Tear Us Apart is out in paperback in the UK uh, this week, or last Thursday, and I've been out signing um, books and stuff in various different locations. I think I've already been to most of the Manchester stores are always great, Deansgate, uh, Trafford Centre, Arndale Centre, Stockport, big shout out to them. They're local to us now, and, and they've been absolutely incredible support. But I've been out signing them, and then I was out, uh, when I was doing them on Saturday, I was in Deansgate. And um, I was wearing a top. You can see the pictures on social media. And one of the lovely people in the the, the, the uh, bookshop went, oh, my God, you've come dressed as the book. Because I had a Leinster rugby top on that it turns out was the exact same colour. 
and it does look like I'm some bloke who tragically came dressed as his own book. Um, so yes, I've been out uh, signing these. I'm going out again tomorrow, assuming the weather isn't entirely horrific, but I'll assume it's drivable. Uh, I'll be tomorrow. I've got oh, I'm doing glamorous. I'm doing uh, the big loop. I'm going Sheffield. I'm going to the Book Vault in Barnsley. Shout out to the Book Vault in Barnsley. It's a fantastic indie shop. Do support me if that if you're in that area at all. Then I'm going uh, from there to Leeds. Then I'll be hitting Olden, Bolton, Preston. Hopefully all them tomorrow if I can get all those done. Assuming the electric car it can charge to get round all that things. It's generally, it's very good, but uh, I won't lie. It's a little bit dodgy in places. Um, but that's the plan for tomorrow. So I'll be in signing. So if there are any local shops, you will have uh, signed books in there. So do go in and grab one. Also, so, um, yeah, I think we'll do this now. Ladies. Yeah, And then we'll bring on the fantastic Brendan. Uh, and we'll have a chat about uh, his new fame. Uh, but basically, we're announcing tonight. Because, you know, and we, and we explained this before. I'm going to turn the heater off. It's getting a bit too warm in here. Uh, it's the joys of live live uh, broadcasting. Basically, I, I've, the charts in in Britain, no, that's it. They work on uh, hardback books, so uh, we love you both. Know, you buy the book in any format. We're delighted. Thank you very much, sincerely. Um, but to uh, sweeten the deal, if you pre-order the hardback, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and the link will be up in the thing for you where you can do all that. Uh, but to pre we're, we're announcing tonight what we're doing, and we've we've always had stuff before where we've had like cards and stuff. Uh, which have been nice and people like the cards, but we are pushing the boat out this time. I mean, we're pushing the boat out. It's hitting iceberg. It's sinking. I'm not, no, that's, that seems like a bad metaphor. Uh, we're pushing the boat out. It's going to space. Yeah, the boat's going to space. That's that's where we are. Um, I'll tell you what you're going to get when you pre-order the book, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, this this is quite the deal. Uh, you're going to get a Stranger Times, an exclusive limited edition Stranger Times newspaper that we've done. This is an actual newspaper. We've seriously made this. Um, it looks absolutely fantastic. It's got like loads of stuff you're not seeing, classified ads, all this different stuff. Uh, they've done an absolutely fantastic job in that. We have a limited amount of these. So anyone who pre-orders in the first few, we don't know when we we'll run out, but get it done as quick as you can. Um, what you'll get, we'll send you anywhere in the world, we'll send you a copy of the newspaper, uh, along with a signed book plate, which is basically a thing you can put in so the book will be signed and we'll put it whatever message you want and stuff. Uh, as well as that, uh, I, anyone who's a fan of the bunny books, uh, other plans just came out a couple of weeks ago. Thank you very much for all of you who've bought it, etc. By the way, generally the response has been very good. Uh, I'll be honest, we were expecting to get a couple of races annoyed. They haven't emailed us. I mean, they may well have been annoyed, but they haven't emailed us. But fans, fans of bull riding have um, no bulls. So maybe they had a point that maybe my attitude towards bull riding was very harsh because bulls never wrote and said, thank you for supporting us. So clearly I've, I'm in the wrong there and the bulls actually enjoy it. But anyway, other plans, I think came up in the, actually the very first chapter in the book. If you actually read the very first chapter of other plans, it refers to stuff happening in Dublin um, or it's stuff that they know uh, that basically about bunny without giving any spoilers away, um, which sort of basically sparked the idea that, oh God, that would have repercussions in Dublin. Um, so I'm now writing the novella called um, Meanwhile in Dublin because, Naaman's hard, and I've gone with the basic here. But meanwhile, in Dublin, I'm actually writing it right at the minute, and um, it's going to be a novella featuring Paul and Bridget, um, Phil, lots of the other Dublin crew. Um, uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. And if you pre-order the book, you will get the ebook, and we think, hopefully, 95% sure, I say this, we haven't actually asked Morgan this yet, but we think this is going to be the case, you will all, we'll also be able to give it to you on audiobook through uh, Book Funnel and stuff. So if you pre-order... Relight my fire. You'll get that early if you're not, you know. And, and then at some point, that will also be in a collection that we're going to do later on for bunny fans. Uh, so don't worry if you can't pre-order the hardback. You will get it eventually. But we're just going to do it early if you're a fan of that. So you get that exclusive free. And also, um, yes, we're having a competition where two people who do pre-order will um, feature in the next Stranger Times book. They will. Have, I say feature. They will have characters named after them. Where somewhere in the articles of the stuff, you'll have your own, which would be, you know, some people love that kind of stuff, which is quite cool. You'll have characters named after you. And also, someone has a chance to win all four of the books signed as well, all four of the Strange Times books. All of that. And all you have to do is pre order the hardback of Relight My Fire. There's a link where I'm sure Elaine will be sharing with you now where you can do that. And then we, again, we appreciate, obviously, if hardback isn't your thing, if it doesn't suit you, don't worry about it. I know it's not for everybody. But if you can, support us by pre, pre, uh, pre ordering the hardback. We would be uh, incredibly grateful for that. And you'll get all that stuff. So how you do that is um, basically it's explained on the, the site. Uh, by the way, I shouldn't say this, but 
Um, it's been a fun couple of weeks because we had two books effectively coming out. Uh, we had problems with our mail thing. We're moving across our email and appreciate your patience. I know some of you might have received a bit more emails than normal because we've been moving from mail things. Uh, last week, uh, our website, the Stranger Times website, went down. Fast host, the people who host it, basically killed it. They've now admitted it was their fault. But we've actually, for tonight, set up the StrangerTims.com, which is a, is a good... If you're a fan of the Stranger Times book, it's a good in-joke. But we set that up as a link to basically use as a temporary website because... So, yeah, God, poor old Wonder Wife has been having it. She was at a gig last night while trying to talk to our web developer, trying to sort that out while uh, seeing Fallout Boy, uh, which was apparently a very good gig. It wasn't as good as Fallout and Har Arms and Hog, though. Um, so, yes... Um, all that's happening. All you need to do is pre-order it and then send us proof of the pre-order of the hardback to Elaine at McForeyInc.com. And again, if you're here this evening, obviously, if you'd like the chance to win the proof, just email that uh, Elaine at McForeyInc.com as well now, and you'll be in the draw for one of them. We'll, be, we'll do that at the end of this. But I think I've covered everything. Let me just check. Uh, private chat's open, love. If you want to confirm if I've covered everything, I think I've done what I'm supposed to be doing. Um... While I'm checking that, by the way. Oh, quick shout out if anyone. Thank you very much. I know a lot of you uh, like the Easter egg video I did at the end of the other time, other plans. Uh, if you've not seen that, if you're a fan of the buddy books and you finished the book, because this is the whole idea I've had basically of doing a video where you, you scan a QR code and put a thing in. You can come in and see me um, talking about the book and I can basically talk about it without giving spoilers away. And the QR code's very handy. It was an idea from Mark Stay, our friend who's done several of these with us. Uh, by the way, Mark's new book, The Holly King, uh, if you get the chance, uh, it's part of the Witches of Woodville series, which is great. I really love them. It's the one with World War II, which is um, in sort of middle England. They're they're an absolute hoot. And The Holly King is the best one yet, frankly. It's great. It's a, I read it there a couple of months ago. Loved it. So if you get a chance, do check them out. He's got a brilliant new book out. And uh, I think that's everything. So my wife hasn't said anything in the private chat because she's probably running around doing a thousand things or... Either that or somebody's driven by the, car the house and uh, Dinner's lost his nut again. Um, so without further ado, I'm just looking at I'm looking at the private chat, hoping that my wife's going to say something in the private chat. She hasn't said anything so far. Uh, OK, well, uh, I'm assuming she's still alive. But, you know, I mean, it is near Halloween, uh, so something could have happened, you know. Um, but I'm hopefully I mean, let's see what's happening. Is Brendan there, ladies and gentlemen? Uh Let's see if we have. Oh, good God! That's worse. <laughs> Hi, Queen. Brendan, how are you, sir? I'm tip top. How are you? I'm I'm very good. Thank it's you for asking. Thank, thank you very much for coming you. on. Yeah, no, I think she's she's taking this as an opportunity. Well, he's, I know where he is for the next hour. I can get to the airport because we are quite close <laughs> to the airport. She can probably be out of the country by the time this broadcast finishes. Makes perfect sense. Yes, um, but uh, we should say congratulate. I mean, Irish people now, there'll be gasps. There'll be women fainting after just you, you appearing on the screen because uh, I was in Ireland a couple of weeks ago and you, my friend, are a little bit famous now. Uh, I think that's a slight exaggeration. <laughs> mild, uh, mild exaggeration. I don't think anyone would be getting too excited at seeing a, a, a grumpy dad, uh, yeah. basically, which is the, uh, the taxing, taxing role that I had to play. To, to explain. Said, we need we need a big grumpy dad i said hold my beer <laughs> yeah to be explained to everyone uh you're the, the fate is vodafone isn't it that's correct i'm, I'm right in thinking that vodafone. there really? are other phone companies that you can use but yes but this particular so why, why would you i mean this one's paying brent <laughs> but yes he's basically he's in a massive ad campaign in ireland where he is the grumpy dad bringing his daughter to like a, a sort of k-pop concert was that yes the idea? yes k-pop concert um, and it's just basically Brendan looking grumpy in a queue, looking grumpy in, 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 at a gig while teenage girls are screaming around him and stuff. And uh, it's very, it's a very funny advert. And he does, he does magnificent work. Um, no acting required. Yeah, but you're on billboards as well now, aren't you? Yes, there are a few of them. yes. <laughs> I love how uncomfortable this makes you. By the way, yeah, I'm getting even redder, even redder than I was coming up from the kitchen. <laughs> well, you, you do magnificent work. I mean, obviously, you know. We all want to be, I hope Hollywood doesn't come calling quite yet because we want you to be doing the audiobook. Um, no, which no, you're, I'll be staying behind the mic, don't you worry. Good, glad to hear it. You'll be, when are you in, because you are you and Paul are scheduled to record Real I My Fire am Audiobook. recording the new book starting with Paul in bit 16 on Tuesday week and I'm as giddy as a goat. I cannot Have wait. you started reading it yet, by the way? 
I sure have. I try and I try and time these things so that I would just finish around the weekend before it. So I'm two thirds of the way through. I didn't get a chance to chat to you earlier on, and thank you for some of the characters you've put in. It's interesting sisters uh, whose whose accents change interchangeably. That's a yes. There, there is genuine when you see now. See that 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 was kind of it's a weird concept where basically characters without spoiling there's three characters who will literally sort of swap voices in a weird way. But have have yeah. you have you noticed the, the the particularly good bit where I put in a nice bit of science for you? Um, I'm I have about I, a third of the book left. Oh no! This is so, you should have got, but maybe just it, it didn't bother you. Basically, uh, and I'll be honest, I put this in. Uh, I have to confess. Oh, Look, right oh! Now. It was it was the the full name for a particular drug. Yeah, yeah, the full name for for ecstasy, which I, I literally yes. was writing the book, and I'll be honest, yes. I only I only put it in because I thought it was hilarious to make him oh, say it. Thank you, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, 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 I'll tell you. I'll tell you next week how many takes it takes me. Because <laughs> um, I think it, just right, was wondering the, the the word is methylene deoxymethamphetamine. Methylene deoxymeth. That's fine. You'll be no problem at all with that man of your experience. Um, <laughs> methylene deoxymethamphetamine. Yeah, be grand. Um, <laughs> but uh, I must have. I genuinely did just put that in. Um, <laughs> But um, yeah, so it's been, but because because we do, we've done a few different things and stuff together. Oh, by by the way, because you know this story, I was telling you this last time I was home. But uh, I've, it's been great. I've been doing a few like conferences and stuff where you turn up, and I've been on panels. Like I've been, you know, Birmingham Der Derby, I've been did Scotland, did the one in Dublin, Opticon as well. Um, and I can I'll tell this story now um, because this is quite bizarre. I've never, I haven't told this to the PR guy from the from the publishers yet, but. Um, Bear in mind, I used to be a stand-up comedian, like so. I must have done oh thousands of gigs overall. This is probably the weirdest thing that's ever happened to me on stage, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I was doing this. I won't say where. I was doing a panel and uh, at this conference, and you're always chatting about you know various different you know different character things or you know endings of stuff or various different things. Uh, you know how how villains work in your books or all that sort of stuff. I was doing this panel and to be honest, I wasn't great for the whole thing. Uh, I, I was very distracted. So at one point somebody asked me a question and I honestly had to bluff it. I wasn't sure what they were asking me. And after the panel was over, I turned to the moderator and went, did you uh, notice anything weird there? And he was like, no, no. And it was like three other people in the panel was like, did, did any of you notice anything weird there? It's like, no. So no one noticed anything weird on the front row. Right. He said, well, exactly. It was, um, there was a gentleman who was in um, sort of costume and he was wearing a kind of kilt is the best way of describing it. Um, and he was doing the traditional Scottish way you're supposedly supposed to wear a kilt, which, as we all know, if you've seen Braveheart, uh, there's no underwear. Um, basically, I was sitting on a panel for an hour looking directly at this fella's hairy two meat and veg. I mean, directly at it. And it was like literally a minute in, it was like, caught my eye like that and was like and I'll Can't be honest look away well, it was, it, 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 and the word that he and he thing is if he'd actually been doing it deliberately because it was a, there was a mix of people on the panel I would have gone whoa okay stop this but he wasn't it was very obvious that this guy had no idea what was <laughs> happening so I couldn't really sort of stop it but I was like when I'm watching him going when I'm watching him move he's no idea and I was even like but like there was like a hundred people in the room and like I don't know how even now I don't know how to mime could you, you know, maybe, maybe your thanks together? <laughs> or, uh... And the most bizarre thing, like literally for the whole time, and even more bizarrely, the guy was wearing an eye patch, which I only noticed halfway through because I was so focused on what was happening below the belt. Um, and the hilarious Should've thing worn was a ball patch. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the most bizarre thing afterwards was uh, bizarrely the guy. It happened to be that the the, um, the sound guy was from Dublin, just by pure coincidence. And like literally the other three panelists and the, 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 the I think the guy for hosting was like, did you see this? And they're all like, no. And I think to the point where they're all thinking, is he making this up? Is this some sort of weird practical joke? And then this guy from Dublin just went, ah, oh, yeah, your man in the front row is bollocks. Yeah, that was out for the whole thing. <laughs> <I was like, laughs> well, at least, you know, I was like, can't help thinking you should have maybe nudged him on the shoulder. But <laughs> that is genuinely the weirdest gig I have ever had. Um, <laughs> But yes, <laughs> um, by, by the way, I, I think you and me need to clarify something for our, our English, actually our British friends, because I've, I've been having this discussion all week with people and you can back me up on this because uh, for our American friends, 
ha- Halloween's always been a big thing over there. And now it's kind of a bigger thing in Britain where they do do stuff for it. Um, and basically, um, of all the time, British people going, oh, it's just an American thing that's been brought over. And Irish people always get wound up about this. So, Brendan, you are a witness for the defence. You can back me up on this. Halloween has always been a massive deal in Ireland, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm an old boy. I was a child of the 70s and 80s. And, um, yeah, ever since I was a little lad, it was, uh, it was dress up. i tell you what has changed in the last maybe 10 years is the notion of decorating your house. So if if I look around my estate now, Jesus, it's ghouls and ghosts and loads of things hanging from people's windows. We have a few here. My my kids are now too old to go trick-or-treating, but certainly when they, when they were younger, um, uh, we used to probably make a bigger deal of decorating the house. But we have our house decorated. 90% of the houses are decorated. That side of things is new where you wouldn't have seen that in in the same way that people decorate for christmas but certainly the um the dressing up and trick-or-treating has always been yeah. a thing as as long as i've been around and the fireworks which to be fair fireworks are actually illegal in ireland yes um, yes you, which but you buy them off, off women in moore street who uh have them <laughs> hidden up their skirt is what i used to do when my kids were younger yeah i mean I, it doesn't always have to be up from a woman's skirt you seem to be going to well specific that's where suppliers. they used to keep them <laughs> Well, that, well, look, but no, yeah, that's true. I can remember like doing, and you'd literally, this is a bizarre thing where they're illegal in Ireland. So what happens is the fireworks that get literally listed as too dangerous in Europe where they're legal or Britain end up coming to Ireland being smuggled in and you end up getting the most yeah. dangerous fireworks. Pretty so, much. I remember my cousin, uh, my brother showed him how to make a genie. You know, when you open a banger and set the fire, the, the, um, the you set the gunpowder off inside it. And it goes. Poof. We didn't do and that I, in South Dublin, where no, I. No, no, it's so far. Too, you're far too. Well, we did it in North Dublin. Oh yeah, we we, we were trying to blow our people. champagne bottles. Yes, but my brother showed my cousin how to do that from Offaly. He was from the country where they hadn't. He was no, it wasn't used to these sophisticated ways. He did that. <laughs> it went whoosh. It was raining, so he's trying to get it right. It went whoosh. Burned off his eyebrows. Uh, my brother has been avoiding my auntie. I'm not kidding you for 20 years because <laughs> because he's terrified of what she's gonna. For, I'm sure, the eyebrows still, have grown back by now. It could it could have been worse. Uh, they have, but the memory has not faded. Uh, I'll tell you that now. <laughs> but um, yeah, because what was your what was your best costume, by the way? Have you had it? Can you remember your best costume? Jesus, it was pretty rudimentary back in those days. To to the point where I definitely do have a memory of uh, a. a you know, a bog standard little mask with an elastic on it. And then, God, as was yeah. the fashion of the time, the, the black bin bag put over you. <laughs> That's I remember using them as well. Second black bin bag. Yes, that like, was that. Oh, yeah, that was yeah, that was back in the days because making your own is always it's it's much more impressive making your own than just buying. Yeah, them. but if you did that to a kid these days, you'd probably have like two slur the social services, the child protection yeah. agency onto you. Like, what are you They're very doing? true? <laughs> Mind you, my, my, my favorite ever costume, and weirdly, I did it as an adult because I was actually going this I was going to a friend's party and I didn't know it was fancy dress till literally that day. I thought my friend was winding me up and it turned out it really was fancy dress. And I thought they were trying to maybe look like an idiot and it turned out I was going to be the one who turned up with no costume. Uh, and what I did was I got all of my sister's old teddy bears, uh, like all of her different stuffed toys. And I stapled them onto a jumper. I had all these, like, I had about 20 stuffed toys of, like, snake, an elephant, a lion, a, a, a couple of bears. And I walked in and everyone went, what the hell have you come at? What are you supposed went, to be? Dublin Zoo. Oh, <laughs> Dublin yes. Zoo. I just came with all the animals pinned on. Beautiful. Me. And basically, a friend of mine, God rest him, had come as, uh, dressed in full Braveheart gear. And he was really annoyed because I won first prize in the competition. And all I did was stay with a load of cuddly toys <laughs> on myself. Well, that's very inventive, Cueve, I must say. Well, yeah, that's, you know, thanks very much. That's that's very much my stock and trade. <laughs> um, by the way, just last reminder, if you are, folks, uh, oh, God, I'll just check the time. We've been rattling on far too long because I'm going to do, a, there is going to be a short story. I'm going to do a live reading of a short story. But just quickly, just last reminder. I know, yeah, t- genuinely, I'll tell you a bit. Elena McFory, Inc.com. If you're here, drop an email just to that email right now. And uh, she at the end of the the doing the short story and stuff, uh, Elaine will come on and we'll pick out somebody and they will win the proof of Relight My Fire. Um, but yeah, I'll be, I'll be honest with you, Brendan, because I've, I've not done much reading and stuff before because um, I talk too fast and all that stuff. 
I think you might have, you might have noticed by now. Um, <laughs> but basically, uh, I, I thought, right, I'll do, a, I'll do a reading of a short story for the spooktacular. And I've written a short story, especially for the spooktacular. It's kind of my version of Frankenstein. Um, but I've been pra- I, I had a practice today, uh, literally like two o'clock, and I was like, nailed it. This is going to go really well. Had a practice at half five. Literally, I was like someone who had learned English 15 minutes ago. Uh, so my point okay, is, well, go on. give us some advice, Brian. Well, well, they used to say in, in theater, you know, if you if you had a if you had a, a bad preview, you were going to have a good opening night, you know. So you don't want to um, shoot your bolt too early, uh, for want of a better phrase. <laughs> Uh, you know, you don't want to go in there and do an amazing... That's an image. You've, you've put an image in people's heads now they're going to be thinking for for the whole half hour I'm talking. It's, it's a metaphor, dear boy. <laughs> uh, Sorry, keep going. So you, don't, you, you don't want to nail it at half five and then, you know, come to showtime and uh, be full of complacency and, you know, just go up and make an absolute horlicks of it. So um, I think in this situation, this is probably a good thing to have messed up at half five because this is how we learn through our mistakes queeve through our terrible awful disastrous mistakes good good uh, if I and, and you know in the words of d ream uh, things can only get better so um <laughs> they, they <I'm>, can't. <laughs> i was explaining by the way I'm to nail it for this one Oh, thank you. By the way, I was I was bizarrely explaining D Ream to somebody uh during the week because it's kind of oddly sort of relevant to the new book in the sense oh. that um Oh yeah, sorry that, with, the, with the band. Yeah, yeah, with the band because um what's the the I'm always I'm terrible at names. What's the famous physician? Um Brian Cox. Brian Cox, yes. Yeah. Brian Cox the basically Ringo. is he was a to explain to Americans what well, probably won't have heard of Brian Cox. I don't know if he's gone international yet, but he's a massive deal in yeah. Britain. He's basically the thinking woman's thinking man. He's you know, he's yeah. explaining science while half the women in the audience would quite happily hope his leg have given any kind of a chance. Um, he's quite the sex. Patrick Moore didn't have that appeal. No, Patrick Moore, very different demographic. Um, <laughs> but basically, yeah, Brian Cox was the keyboard player in a band called Dream in the 90s. And then he went back and got his master's in physics. And he's brilliant at explaining science to people to make it easy for, for the plebs like us. And he's also quite the sex symbol. But the main character, well, not the main character, one of the guys in uh, Relight My Fire, basically the idea was, uh, what if Brian Cox was evil and was trying to make a comeback by trying to, uh, yeah... That was actually in the pitch, by the way, for the for genuinely I wrote, I wrote the pitch and the publisher for Real Life of Fire. The publisher came back and said, we love it, but you're not actually going to use Brian Cox, are you? It's like, no, <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to use an actual real person. I, I understand that's bad. That would I be bad. It. By the way, I was trying, I genuinely was trying to find some vocal exercises yesterday to try and, you know, work up the old voice. <laughs> um, you know, the, do, you do, do you do those? Like the red lorry, yellow lorry, red lorry, yellow lorry, all that stuff? I never do any warm-ups for anything. <laughs> Don't tell anyone. No one else is watching good. this, are they? No, you're fine. What? Oh, that's good. But to be honest, because I, I find them, because like, no, one of them I... is like the... So you don't do, have it's you ever even when you're alive and all it is sick this red lorry yellow lorry yeah. she sells seashells by yeah. the seashore that's the one that really got to me because I literally was trying to do these I was like why is she selling seashells by the seashore that's where the seashells I'm trying, are I'm trying to deconstruct it I mean it's just <laughs> but it doesn't make any vocal exercise don't look for the logic well, sell the seashells in the middle of uh Sheffield she sells seashells in the middle of Sheffield that's not near yeah. the sea that would make sense. But no, that's not where she's selling them. Um, right. Well, oh God, Roddy, oh, we're over, uh, Roddy, oh God, past half seven. I can't put this off any longer, Brendan. I'm going to have to read the um, story. Well, I, I hope you don't get interrupted from my side because there are a series of fireworks going off, and that's fine. But what I'm waiting for now is my dog Dougie to go absolutely insane. And oh, have you, is this your first? This isn't your first Halloween with him, is it? This is our second Halloween with Dougie. Yeah. Oh, okay. Because does he react to the fireworks? Oh yeah, oh but, yeah. See, this is but weir- weirdly enough. There's been no reaction because we, weirdly uh, that we had that because you know Diller's quite like Diller gets wound up like if, if a van goes yeah. by and stuff, he gets very excited and stuff. He goes, yeah. he goes, and if anyone rings the doorbell, it's gas because he sounds like he's trying to rip somebody apart. What he's actually trying to do is run out and lick somebody. It's literally just runs out and tries to lick people. That's kind of um, like Dougie, yeah, yeah. But but bizarrely, like Diller sort of reacts to all these sorts of things. 
And we had, oh my God, back in the days when oh, when the pandemic and we all had to go out and clap for the NHS. Do you remember? I, we didn't, you didn't have this in Ireland, but no. we had this thing at seven o'clock on a Thursday or six o'clock. We all went outside yeah. and clapped for the NHS. And we all did it. And to be honest, in hindsight, you kind of think, because don't be wrong, the NHS are magnificent, but I think we should we should probably show our appreciation by giving them the pay rise they deserve. Mm. But yeah. we used we used to do this, right? So everyone went out and you almost felt like compelled, even you were going to go and, oh, it feels like it's such a token thing. There was a guy who used to live behind us in our old house, who I'm not kidding. I think he must have literally owned a fireworks factory or something. <laughs> because bear in mind, this was in the summer in lockdown. Over lockdown, he Where's literally... He set fire to, I'm not kidding, a nurse's salary worth of fireworks in broad <laughs> daylight to thank the NHS. And you're like, God, just give them the give money. Them money. <laughs> All you're doing is upsetting every dog in the neighborhood, except ours, bizarrely. Because I was saying, Jitter, bizarrely, doesn't react to anything. Um, before we start, by the way, uh, uh, us ladies call that foreplay. I don't know what that refers to by Brendan McDonald, oh. but. Sorry, that's a couple minutes ago. I think that's probably out of context. Someone's asking, what beer are you drinking, by the way, Brent? Before we start. Before I'm, before. I'm, I'm in Kildare, and I'm drinking a, a local uh, the Crafty Brewing Company, um, their Pale Ale. Available in, in all good Irish Lidl stores. Living the dream. Fair, fair, look at them, fair play to you. But, but, by Irish, is very impressive. Uh, I'm it's drinking water. I have to read a thing. Um, yeah, well, so I have I'm, drink, I'm drinking for two, which is why I'm drinking. Yeah, I do, I do have a crate of cider. My my bless them, genuinely. My um, I think my publishers have finally realised I'm not a champagne guy. Yeah, they're like send you woman a book comes out. Now. Yeah, no, so I'm not. So I, but now they they just send me a crate of cider now. <laughs> win win. Is, yeah, it's much it's much more me. Um, C cell C cell was inspired by a real person, Mary Anna, a fossil collector, and the person featured in the film. I'm an, wow. Maria Gammon coming in with some massive knowledge in the comments. Wow. C cells, C cells was inspired by a real person, Mary Anning, a fossil collector, and the person featured in the film Ammonite. Well, this is incredible news, Mary, Maria. I mean, as a man who now has to read something, I'm tempted to spend the next 25 minutes Googling this and we can all have a chat about it. Yeah. But I'm guessing my wife will give out to me because I promised to read a story. Um, uh, so, oh, Brennan said he never just warm up for anything. Ah, right, okay. I now understand the earlier thing about foreplay. Fair play to you. Uh, that just makes sense. Well, and on that note, I mean, weirdly, that, that's kind of features in the um, thing, it does kind of feature in the story. So I think without further ado, Brendan, you're, you're going yeah, to. Yeah, you're going for it. Okay. So just, let me know how I do. Um, just um, last word of advice just okay. picture everyone naked. Good. Well, that's, I mean, to be honest, I, I'm only wearing, I'm wearing a hoodie and nothing else. So I'm assuming everyone well, else is. Obviously I'm naked from the top down. So yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm picturing the entire well, you, front you row. Insisted, so you told me. Yeah. To. Yeah. Well, I mean, I actually asked you to wear some clothes. I didn't mean not wear all the clothes. It's a different <laughs> I, thing, I, Brent. I'm many, many inspired fashion tonight. Yeah. But anyway, it's nice to see you and not wearing the kilt this time. Uh, <laughs> You're so <laughs> Somebody, somebody in the thing. It was Brendan. It was Brendan. That's what I'm saying. It was Brendan. <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> and people, anyway, people always ask that question. You can see everything. Like, oh, yeah. I know what religion, religion that dude is. Um, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> uh, without, thank you very much, Brendan. I hope to see you again at the end. We'll have the, the last call Pleasure. for email Lane to get the, the proof. Thank you, Brendan. We'll see you in a bit. And I think. Thanks, everyone. Let me just check the private chat. As my wife, my wife hasn't put anything in the private chat. So I'm assuming. I'm absolutely nailing this, uh, which seems unlikely. <laughs> She's never not had notes before, but I'm checking the private ha chat and I can't see anything in it. So um, <clears throat> I think without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to start reading this. And weirdly, I'm basically, I can't see the thing now. So feel free to talk about it while I'm gone. I I'm going to take the headphones off. Let me just, I'm getting slightly paranoid now, if I'm honest. Let me just check back in. Uh, all good. Okay. She said all good. Okay. Um, in which case... I will start reading the story now. So uh, apologies in advance. I will give this the best shot I can. But, you know, this isn't what I do for a living. Thank God. If this is good, Brennan's going to be worried. So here we go. <clears throat> it was a dark and stormy night. Or at least it would have been if the weather had any sense of occasion. As it was, it was just raining. A steady Mancunian rain, slanting slightly to the left, regardless of which way you were standing. On the upside, it was at least enough to dissuade all with most committed of trick-or-treaters. Victor's father had always hated Halloween, or rather, what it had become. So commercialised. 
Every year, he'd berated people who'd knocked at their door for reducing the most important date in the pagan calendar to a fancy dress party. It was a stance that had not made them popular on the estate. <clears throat> a few years ago, while in the midst of a particularly impassioned monologue on the subject, a woman from three roads away had smacked Dad right in the eye with a toffee apple. Victor had spent an hour with a pair of tweezers, surgically removing his father's eyelashes from a fruit-based confectionery nightmare. They had never fully grown back until, oddly, the Undertaker had restored them in death. Victor had taken some consolation from that, given that the council had forbidden him for fulfilling his father's dying wish of a funeral pyre on a raft in Deansgate Lock. It was health and safety gone mad. After the Toppy Apple incident, his father had cast a spell and nobody knocked on their door at Halloween ever again. It was almost certainly the spell that did it, but every year, just to be on the safe side, Victor stuck a big picture of Jesus on the front door. In his experience, most people didn't believe in that man, but they were still terrified of speaking to anyone who did. For as long as Victor could remember, it had just been him and Dad. Victor didn't have many friends, seeing as he'd been homeschooled. Dad said it was pointless him going to an ordinary school, as they'd just try and stifle his genius. His earliest memory was being told he was a genius, and now, at the age of 24, it was taken as a matter of fact. Albeit one, he'd had a hard time explaining to the woman at the job centre. Victor's genius took many forms. For a start, he was a word evader, a maker of new words. In fact, he made up word evader, thus proving himself to be one. Shakespeare had been one, Tupac too, and now him. Other people claimed to be word evaders, except they used the term wordologist, which was just proof that they weren't true word evaders. It wasn't just as simple as making up random nonsense. There was so much more to it than that. At its heart, it was the art of finding expression for the untold story of human existence. Take bagger sense. His word for the gnawing feeling of having driven to the supermar supermarket and forgotten yet again to bring brags with you. Or pasqualopathy, the belief that your good idea was really someone else's first, but being absolutely fine with that. After tonight, no one would dare to doubt Victor's genius ever again. He was about to bring new life into the world. Now, yes, people had been doing that for, well, by definition, the entirety of human history, and the act of creating life in itself wasn't that impressive. This had been borne out only yesterday, when the heavily pregnant woman at the bus stop had called him a pedo because he wouldn't give her a cigarette. Victor didn't smoke, and more importantly, he was pretty sure she shouldn't have been either. The difference between Victor and that woman, well, one of the differences, there were actually loads. Uh, for a start, he wasn't female, pregnant, or a smoker. He also hadn't tattooed the word mum on his arm, and then later added the words fuck you above it for reasons that weren't entirely clear. But the single biggest difference as pertained to this momentous moment was that he was bringing life fully formed into the world as opposed to a baby that would be squeezed out and inevitably have its ears pierced at far too young an age. His creation lay before him on the kitchen table. All right, she wasn't technically his creation, yet. Technically, she was a product supplied by the Nakatoma Corporation in the Philippines. Victor strongly disliked the words sex doll. For a start, she wasn't a doll, but a state-of-the-art programmable android. A Francine 5000. Francine was an oddly old lady name for something whose advertising bump had emphasised its frankly impractical curves and wipe clean features. But Victor supposed the Filipinos had just picked a name with no obvious celebrity associations to avoid lawsuits. He wasn't worried about the whole sex android angle of all this, but it was either that or start digging up bodies. That seemed extremely icky and and people always underestimated this, it is actually really hard to dig up a grave. Victor had never been good at physical exercise, having been a steady C student in PE, or running laps around, laps around the garden of their small terraced house, as it could be more accurately described. Admittedly, the programming options available on the basic Francine 5000 model were very limited, as indicative by the fact that most of the so-called personality types were illustrated in the instruction manual with stick figure drawings 
some of which involved implements. All this, however, was about to change. The genius of Victor's approach was twofold. First, he paid extra for massive processor and memory upgrades to allow him the capacity to upload additional personality programming. He'd combined chat GTP with a script of his favourite film, Alien, and a transcript of two shows by Victoria Wood, his father's favourite comedian, plus three sample chapters from the book Fix the System, Not the Woman, which he downloaded free from Amazon. These, Victor felt, would provide a more well-rounded individual. He'd also tweaked Francine's programming to include her under her fantasies bringing down the patriarchy, as Victor was a feminist. He wasn't entirely sure what he meant by that, as up to this point in his life, he'd had remarkably little contact with the opposite sex. But he regularly gave women big thumbs up out the window of the bus when he saw them doing stuff. The second fold of his twofold approach was the application of the occult. Victor wasn't a wizard like his dad, but he still understood enough about it to grasp the fundamentals of magic. Certain items retained magical properties, and those properties could be drawn upon, sort of like batteries. With that in mind, after spending a whopping £15,000 on the customizable Francine 5000, he'd use his remaining £400 to acquire objects of latent magical power to perform the ritual he had planned. He'd gone to Paolo's Emporium in Affleck's Palace, widely regarded as the shop for the serious magic user, and bought two Himalayan salt lamps, a dream catcher, some Maprinian spoons, and a crocheted portrait of Alastair Crowley. To cover all bases, he'd also trawled the local charity shop and found an inexplicably unnerving picture of a blonde child, the stuffed head of a moose, half a dozen ceramic gnomes with haunting eyes, and a portrait so magnificently awful that the one-word title Queen on the frame still left the peruser wondering if the subject was the dearly departed monarch or Freddie Mercury from the band Queen. That item hadn't felt particularly eldritch, but the nice old lady in the shop had thrown it in for free. In fact, she'd given him everything free as a thank you for taking the picture. He normally would never have taken something for free from a charity. However, he fundamentally didn't understand why Bolton needed a donkey sanctuary. He was confused as to what donkeys were being saved from, and to what end. What's more, every time he asked the old lady in the past, she'd been very shifty about it. He had a sneaking suspicion that the Bolton Donkey Sanctuary was a front organisation for something far more sinister. And the old lady was definitely in on it. His father had often stated that people had a real blind spot when it came to automatically trusting the elderly. All old people were, were people who'd got old. Victor was ready to begin the ritual. He'd finished lighting the candles. If there was one thing he'd learned watching his father performing spells over the years, it was that you couldn't have too many candles. If there was a second lesson, it was always have a fire extinguisher, ha extinguisher handy, as all the aforementioned candles and his father's penchant for long sleeve robes were a very dangerous combination. These candles were particularly pleasing as they were dark purple and black, and had those all-important dribbly qualities. These were the good candles that his father used on special occasions. If he was just conjuring some basic ill on the man who'd been rude to him in little, then the tea lights from Ikea would suffice. But for the momentous spells, he'd always instructed Victor to bring out the big guns. Along with the candles, the various items Victor had acquired were now spread out around the kitchen table. The air was thick with magic and the scent of burning lavender because, as his father was wont to say, you couldn't find an unscented candle these days for love nor money. This would be the night. Victor could feel it in his bones. Admittedly, this wasn't the first time he'd felt it in his bones, to the point where his bones were becoming quite suspect. The first time had been two weeks ago, on a stormy night, Wonderful ambiance. Victor had been mid-ritual when the doorbell had rung and he'd opened it to find a man asking if he got a TV licence. A 20-minute argument had ensued where Victor had assured the man he didn't need or want a TV licence and how all mainstream media was a con. 
the man kept bringing up something called match of the day. And when he'd finally seen him off, Victor returned to his ritual to discover one of the candles had been too close to Francine, burning her little toe and causing it to melt slightly. On the second occasion, which was a week ago, there'd been actual lightning. Infuriatingly, he'd had to abandon the ritual when Francine's software had failed to compile correctly. He'd spent two days ringing Nakatomi, Nakatomi technical support, trying to get that issue resolved. They'd kept picking up the phone, shouting about not giving refunds and slamming it down again. He'd eventually found an answer on an online forum. And once he'd updated the firmware, things seemed more promising. Previously, the little green bar, which stretched across the screen, had crashed when it reached 78%. But it was now at 94. It was working. It was really working. Of course, Halloween was the ideal night to do this, but Victor had initially not wanted to wait. This had less to do with his desire to prove his genius to the world and more to do with where he'd borrowed the £15,400 from. Ivan, the mad Russian. It was a hyperbolic name, but an apt one. He was certainly mad. For a start, Ivan wasn't Russian. He was actually a bloke called Darren, who was the same age as Victor. As children, they'd been in Salford Amateur Dramatic Society together. Darren, Darren had gone from what, in Victor's opinion, had been a very showy Peter Pan, to deciding at some point in his adolescence that he was Russian and, if the stories were, be, were to be believed, had then stayed in character for 14 years and counting. He'd not even managed to stay in character for the whole of Peter Pan, so he'd come a long way in that regard at least. If what Victor had read on the internet and overheard in the bus was to be believed, Ivan was now one of Manchester's premier mobsters, having set up his own version of the Russian mob that incredibly featured no actual Russians. That part might have been fantasy, but his uncompromising methods were a terrifying reality. Ivan had been charged with murder, attempted murder, and a shopping list of other offences, but none of them had ever come to court due to his witnesses recanting their testimonies or just disappearing altogether. Mr. Ibrahim from Three Doors Down had been late on payments and ended up with a broken arm. Luckily, he was a lollipop man, so it didn't affect his work, but the clear message had nevertheless been sent. Victor had not wanted to go to Ivan for the money, but conventional banking was incredibly small-minded in its lending criteria. The green bar ticked on the screen over from 95% to 96% compiled. This was it. This was definitely it. All of the hard work was about to pay off. Victor began the chanting. Mawa ka ka wa wa na na. Victor's dad had explained that the act of chanting was more important than what you were actually saying. Izzy wizzy, let's get busy. Victor tried to remain calm as the portrait of the Queen or Freddie Mercury started to glow with a hazy orange light. 97% compiled. Tinky winky la la po. The orange light was expanding now, growing in intensity. 98%. The kitchen table was shaking. The orange light throbbing. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Victor shielded his eyes, the light emanating from the picture now so bright he could no longer look directly at it. 99%. Everything in the kitchen was shaking now. Victor swore that he could feel the heat of the light burning against his cheeks. Then one of the wonky eyed gnomes exploded. 100% compiled. The air was electric and tasted of iron. It felt as if reality was going to tear itself asunder right there and then in his kitchen. The moose's head made a sound remarkably like a howl. All the rest of the gnomes exploded one after the other. One of the salt lamps went out. The candles remained lit. A black candle quickly learns to expect shit to get weird and is hence reliable in all manner of stressful situations. Victor, on the other hand, was freaking out. What could he do? What could he do? He remembered what he could do. 
he reached across and pressed enter on the keyboard. And it all stopped. The chaos ceased so suddenly that he wasn't that if it wasn't for the still smoking remains of the gnomes, he couldn't be sure if it had happened at all. That and the fact that the woman on the table in front of him opened her eyes, sat up, and smiled at him. Hello, darling. My, that made a mess. I'm famished. Shall I get started on dinner? Victor sat nervously in the front room, hugging a cushion to himself. Francine had been in the kitchen now for 15 minutes, cooking dinner. She had informed him that she was cooking duck a l'orange, which seemed particularly ambitious, seeing as he neither had a duck or an orange, which he assumed were, to, he assumed were two of the most fundamental requirements for that dish. He didn't say anything because, well, up until this point, Francine had merely been an idea, a concept. In more practical terms, a vessel wrapped in lifelong silicon skin substitute containing what the Nakatoma Corporation proudly called the cutting edge in Android technology. Now, she was a five foot ten blonde woman standing in his kitchen, putting something into the big pot. She was doing all of this while naked. Victor hadn't dressed her before the ritual, as then Francine had just been one of the objects. But now, now, well now, now she was very naked in his kitchen. He was aware that naked was technically a binary state, but she was like really, really naked. He had acquired a nice summer dress from the charity shop, and he'd pointed gingerly at it hanging on the back of the door. But she just smiled and asked him if he had corn flour. He knew that what he knew what corn and flour were individually, but he'd never known there was some kind of hybrid. Tonight was full of firsts. Victor was really worried about dinner. What if what she came up with was inedible or poisonous? Was cooking even part of her programming? He toyed with the idea of ringing tech support again, but dismissed it. He imagined the invocation of black magic would have voided the warranty. It was probably buried somewhere in the 47 pages of terms and conditions. The kitchen door flew open and Francine strode in. Victor stared into her dreamy blue eyes, first and foremost because looking at anything below that point seemed incredibly rude. She gave him the kind of heart-stopping smile that he'd never experienced before in his young life. Darling, dinner will be ready in 20 minutes. Down with the patriarchy. Victor cleared his throat. Oh, okay. And after that, I thought you could spend the rest of the night making mad, passionate love to me. With that, she turned and left the room. Victor was no longer worried about dinner. Right, thought Victor. How hard could this be? That was an unfortunate choice of words. He'd never had sex before, but people did it all the time, didn't they? That horrible woman at the bus stop had clearly managed it. All he needed was some basic instructions, and he'd no doubt pick it up fast. He was, after all, a genius. It would be like riding a bike, in that he'd never done it personally, but he regularly saw people hard at it on the path beside the canal. He picked up his phone. Google was his friend here. Perhaps someone had put something on the internet about sex. It turned out they had. Quite a lot, in fact. After some false starts and other distractions, Victor was now on page 26 of what was described as a beginner's guide to sex. He'd already skipped over most of the foreplay section. Not that he was against the concept. It was just that when the other person was naked and demanding sex, there was probably not that much foreplay required. It was then that the doorbell rang. Bloody trick-or-treaters. That was the last thing Victor needed. Damn it. He had forgotten to put up the picture of Jesus. He'd ignore them. He had no time for that now. I'll get it, my love, came the shout from the kitchen. Victor was out of his chair like a rocket. No, my, um, no, no need. I'll get it. He rushed to the door and, after checking that there wasn't a naked woman standing behind him in the hall, he opened it. He'd been so concerned about what was behind him they would not given due thought to what was going to be on the other side of the door. It wasn't kids looking for sweets. It was a mad non-Russian Russian looking for money. Ivan favoured him with a gold-toothed smile. Victor, my friend.
Though I even said his name sounded more like a vampire from black and white Hollywood movie than Russian to Victor, but I even didn't strike him as a man who would take notes well. Behind the approximate Russian stood two massive menacing slabs of humanity, who didn't speak, and yet who sent a terribly clear message. Ivan, hi, oh, lovely to see you. To be honest, now isn't a brilliant time. Is there any chance you could pop back tomorrow? Pop back tomorrow, repeated Ivan. He turned to one of the henchmen. Pop back tomorrow. Sure, Terry, check my schedule. Let's see if we can find a time that suits Victor here to give me my fucking money. He shouted the last bit. The inference was obvious. At least, it was obvious to everyone except Terry. You've the dentist in the morning. What? snapped Ivan. The dentist repeated Terry. You cancelled the last two and you said whatever happens we were to pinky promise not to let you cancel this time. I know what I said Terry. I was being rhetorical. All right you, you should have said. If I did it wouldn't have been rhetorical then would it? Actually said the other guy technically saying you're being rhetorical doesn't stop you from asking a rhetorical question. Ivan turned his eyes to heaven. Christ, Bob, one year of the Open University and suddenly everything is an academic definition with you. Bob's massive bottom lips turned over slightly. You said you were proud of me for improving myself. I am, I just... Ivan waved a hand at Victor. I'm here to collect £20,000 off this guy, not argue semantics. Um interrupted Victor. It's actually £15,400? It was, agreed Ivan, but then there is the interest. Well, it's only been a month. It's not legal. Actually, started Bob, but was silenced by a raised hand from Ivan. So help me one more word from you, Bob, and I'm going to make you wait in the car. Bob clamped his mouth shut. Now, said Ivan, Back to my £20,000. Right, said Victor, going for honesty being the best policy. I'll admit, I don't have the money at the moment, but I'm sure, given time, I will have no problem coming up with it. All right, well, that sense had at least started out honest if it had veered wildly into wishful thinking at the end there. OK, I appreciate your candor, Victor, and in recognition of that, I am willing to allow you to pick which of your limbs, Mr. Open University here, is going to break. Is everything all right, darling? Came the voice from behind Victor in the hallway. He did not need to turn around to see if Francine had put on clothing since the last time he'd seen her. Terry's gulping expression was enough to confirm that she definitely had not. What is this? said Ivan. You don't have my money, but you can afford to buy a horse? Excuse me, said Francine. No offence, darling, I'm sure you're of good value. I only mean you're out of this poor fool's price range. You are a disgusting man, and I suggest you get out of here this instant. And maybe you should calm down and put some clothes on, sugar tits. You strike me as being part of the patriarchy. Now, um, started Victor, feeling increasingly like both this conversation and his life in general were getting away from him. Ivan jabbed a finger in Francine's direction. Now you need to shut up. I will not hit a woman. I have Terry for that. He is bi-violent, willing to hit absolutely anybody. Francine pushed Victor to one side. He stared at the ceiling, trying very hard to think of anything to say or do to stop the unfolding nightmare. And to think just a couple of minutes ago, all he'd been worried about was sex. Now there was going to be violence. And while he wasn't sure he'd be great at the former, he definitely knew he was terrible at the latter. In truth, he wasn't a lover or a fighter, but he was prepared to at least give one of them a go. Don't you point at me, you beastly little man, said Francine. It was at this juncture that Ivan's hand reached forward to do something more than point, and all hell broke loose. Without being aware of it, Victor crumpled to the ground. He at least did so voluntarily. Ivan, on the other hand, 
was very much compelled there by a swiftly delivered kick to his nether regions. Francine was a blur of buck-naked femininity mixed with rampant, unadulterated violence. Victor somehow lost track of time as everything blurred. He didn't realise it was over until Francine laid a soft hand on his cheek. Darling, are you all right? Did they hurt you? She helped him unsteadily to his feet. It was only then that he looked at the massive groaning humanity that lay on the pavement in front of them. All three men were alive, although they weren't enjoying being so. It had been a literal bonding experience for Ivan, Bob and Terry, as each of them now had another man's limb shoved somewhere the sun didn't shine, forming a nightmarish daisy chain. Its disentanglement would require extensive medical assistance and a proctologist being signed off work for a month because of his nerves. Victor stood there in silence for a long moment, looking down at the destruction Francine had wrought. Then she sighed and said the words that more than anything from that night would haunt Victor. Oh dear, it's happened again. Victor looked at her in confusion. She took him in her strong arms, dipped him down and planted a kiss on him that rocked his world. When it was over, he stood gasping for breath as, in the distance, sirens could be heard ripping through the Mancunian night. She brushed her fingers lightly through his hair. I'm sorry, my love. I guess I'd better be going. Know that I will always be with you. She, then, she kept looking at him, but raised her voice pointedly. And no, that should anyone come back here looking for money, I will definitely be here. Someone behind them groaned something unintelligible in Russian. It had to be said, impressive staying in character even then. Before Victor could find the words, she placed a soft final kiss on his cheek and then Francine leapt onto the roof of his terraced house and disappeared into the night. Victor quietly closed the front door behind him. He walked back into his kitchen and managed to rescue a towel covered in marmite that had been roasting in the oven before it burned the whole house down. As the smoke alarm warbled, Victor looked at the framed picture, which no longer featured either the Queen or Freddie Mercury. It was now a perfect rendering of Francine beaming out at him. Many a night he would sit in his front room, staring up fondly at that portrait that now hung above the mantelpiece, and she would smile down upon him. Visitors would often comment how the nipples seemed to follow you across the room. He never did see her again, but he knew she was out there. She was there in the urban legends, the rumours, the whispers on the wind. The builder who catcalled a woman walking by a sight, only to later be found half buried in his own cement, bollock naked. The trio of drunk lads following a woman home, telling her to smile, and they were just being friendly, who were inexplicably discovered 35 miles away in the African painted dog enclosure of Chester Zoo, covered in gravy. To others, she was vengeance. She was a warning. She was the patriarchy's worst nightmare. And to one particular proctologist, she'd be the reason he'd leave medicine entirely and retrain as a barista. But not to Victor. No. To Victor, she would always be that final kiss. The end. Uh, now, I'll be honest with you folks, I hope that was working because I realised halfway through that that I had no idea if the mic was in any way working or not. Oh, thank God. Was it working? Oh, genuinely. <laughs> that was the weirdest experience half an hour ago. And I mean, I presume my wife will ring me if the mic is broken down or something. But, <laughs> oh, man. Now, now I'm having a point. Uh, <laughs> several, in fact. Thank you very much. I probably should have given a warning beforehand that it, it was a little bit uh, vivid in certain places. Uh, I actually rewrote the bit about the three guys with the limbs at the end. Probably should have run that report. I wonder why if I, I wrote it. But anyway, thank you very much. I'm glad you've all enjoyed it. Um, uh, Brendan, if you're still there, let's take Brendan on. Let's get a professional's opinion. Uh, <laughs> it's a it's a yes from me. I uh, <laughs> I will I will uh, I will retire my microphone i'll hang up my ear goggles and uh you can join paul in the studio um did, next, did, next tuesday did you know uh, by listen, the way well done. i thought that was really terrific i thought you did a great job i particularly oh. liked um 
the suspense that you built up while while it was loading up 97 98 99 and I liked your uh, stereotypical Russian. <laughs> where's my fucking money? Uh, well, see, well, see, basically, I had the idea. I was like, oh, God, I've got to do a character here. Because I was writing the thing and I was going to read it. And I thought, I'll make him somebody who's not actually Russian, who's pretending to be Russian. And then I'm bulletproof. Yes, perfect. It's like, Cause, cause cause you, I, na you nailed the accent of it not being entirely Russian. Yes, I was very good at not being <laughs> Russian. Yes. I actually, bizarrely, uh, I took that from John Malkovich in the film Rounders, which is like the, the poker one with Matt Damon. And I actually took it from Matt Damon telling a story about John Malkovich doing. And Did how he you see that story where, where, where Matt Damon is telling it and then Malkovich turns around to him and goes, I'm a terrible actor. Yes, is exactly that? that story. That's what I was thinking of. I love it. He was this. literally came in and just did it so over the top. But yeah, oh that's what I heard. God, it's doing. so over the top. It is. Um, that was brilliant. Oh, well, thank God that's over. Uh, excellent. I'm delighted. Well done. Well done, Queeve. On behalf of everyone, that was, that was well, really thank good. Thank you very much, sir. I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you very much. I mean, no higher praise than coming from the face, face of Vodafone. I mean, that's... Uh, so thank you very much. Sir. I prefer to be known as the voice of the Stranger Times. Okay, the voice, the voice of Stranger Times, the voice of Stranger Times, the face of Vodafone, and uh, the dream of women everywhere. Um, and gay men. <laughs> let's, not, let's not restrict you. Uh, I'm sure you've got quite the following in all in all camps. Um, <laughs> Certainly, but yes. Um, I think all that's left to do is we probably have to find out who's going to win a pre winner. Just yeah. one reminder: if you do pre-order, uh, get it, go to Elaine. It's, it's this bit off screen, but Elaine at McFarreyInc.com. There's a link there that Elaine will have put up, I'm sure, and we'll be sending out an email and stuff and pre-order, and you'll get your copy of the newspaper, ladies and gentlemen. We'll send that to anywhere in the world, along with a signed book plate. You'll also get access to uh, Meanwhile in Dublin. <gasps> oh, look at Dougie! I've lost entirely, Dougie Jack. Uh, Sorry. Dougie came into the room, so. Oh, I love Dougie. He's great. And he likes me. I've been to Brendan's house. He does and, like uh, you. He gave a big warning about his dog because a bit funny about visitors. And then he came in and literally started licking my hand straight away. Oh, my God. He loved you. He, he's a lovely yeah. little fella. I'm, I'm, I'm quite the... I'm the dog whisperer. That's me. Um, you are. Award, sorry, someone's pointed out. Oh, yes, award winning voice of the Stranger Times. Uh, we should say yes because you and well, me were both, both of us, both of us. Well, both of us and uh, the podcast, but mainly the audiobooks and stuff. I mean, and is it seriously, we've said it before, it's acknowledgement of your fantastic work. And uh, let's not do the thing we're both complimenting each other, we're both Irish. Oh, you. Very no, you're brilliant. Just, yeah, we, every time we do that, we just start getting more and more like even we do at the pub and you try and say something nice, and then I just say something nice back to you. And we, yeah, we're both holding our points going, oh, God, make it stop. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Queeve, you're shit. Right. Uh, yeah, you're much shit. more comfortable yeah. with that. It's now, now it's like talking to family. Um, <laughs> so I think now, uh, Wonder Wife, if you're there, do you want to pop on and we'll do it? So yes, yeah, yeah, do, do this. You'll get copy to me. Uh, you get access to me while I'm the ebook and we think the audiobook. All of you pre order as well as a signed book plate, and you'll be entered in the competition. You get a character named after you, and you'll be a legend in your own lifetime uh, for the rest of human history, indeed. And there she is. Hello, my love. Hello. So I, I know I normally have my wonderful wheel, the colourful psychedelic wheel of. She knows, by the way, she said nothing about my reading there. This, this is my oh, wife's policy is to, to not Good give me comments. <laughs> I'm, I'm on a mission. I'm focused. You know, I'm here for a purpose, not to uh, yeah. strike your ego. Yeah. Although, as everyone said, we're now all completely distracted by the dog. We just want to look at the dog for. <laughs> Sorry, he just he came into the room. So. Do you want to have a dog off? Is Dilla, is Dilla, are they falling asleep? Are they on the couch? Uh, Where are they? Dilla has only just gone and huffed onto a sofa. He's been sat here looking at me, wanting to be petted as I'm trying to um, get everybody's names down. So uh, I think yeah. he's eventually given up. He's had a few head strokes and now he's decided it's time yeah. to go to the, bed. Bless him. The, the other fella just goes in the corner and doesn't, doesn't care. He literally doesn't care if you're in the room or not. Whereas the dealer is like constantly, he's a nanny dog. He's desperately obsessed. He can't relax. He will, if you let him out, he'll come up and bark at the door. If I'm working late at night, he'll come up and bark at the door of my office demanding I come down to the house. And then he like sheep dogs me down by like lassing me mm. back in. Um, but uh, oh, he's a lovely little fella. Right. Uh, do you want to do the? Uh, have you have you yes. drawn so, the winner? If you could give me a number between uh, zero, not oh. zero, one, obviously, and one hundred and thirty, please. Between uh, zero and 100, uh, 130. I will go for. I mean, Bren, if you what's 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 your favorite number between zero and one hundred and thirty? Let's go for a totally random one hundred 
and 22. <gasps> I didn't think he'd go that high. Oh, okay. wow. Yeah. Mac, who's 122? 122 is Matthew King. There you go, man. Matthew, Matthew King. King. Congratulations, sir. Uh, you've won Brendan's dog. Uh, he'll be sending him in the post here. <laughs> no. no good dog. No. You have won. Uh... I wonder if I can get it directly. But sorry, this is now just, yeah. Uh, okay. yeah. You've won that. Well, that would make oh, the amazing effect. You've won a, a proof of that. So uh, email us your address, my friend, and we will send you this in the post uh, in the coming days. Don't put it on eBay. Don't be, don't be a dick. Um... And it is absolutely <laughs> brilliant. I can tell you I'm loving it. It's the final third of it. I cannot wait to get into the studio to to do it. it, it it's so good. It's so good. Oh, well, thank you very much. And uh, I think that's it. We've done everything, I think. So, yeah, pre-orders and stuff. The I'm link. just going to pop the Stranger Tim's website back on because I've seen a couple of people saying, because yeah. the newsletter link is broken, unfortunately, as Cueve explained oh, earlier. Yeah, you're back. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's um, basically... Um, <laughs> our website died like three days ago, which is not good time. And it's it's be clear, it's fast host. I mean, I don't want to. Um, yeah, I'm going to throw them under the bus. It's fast host. They've admitted they screwed it up, and um, they're supposedly fixing it for us now. Um, but yeah, so we had to get the Stranger Tims, which is a good in joke, if nothing else. Dot code. Which was in, in book one, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's the whole point. The T-shirt exactly that Simon was yeah. wearing. So if you go to that, like as I said, uh, get your pre-order as quick as you can. We have uh, a limited. We've got a fair few of them, but there is a limited stock of these. So do get your pre-order in and we'll get that all sent out to you. It'll probably go out in January once we've got everything else sorted out, as well as the short story, pro the ebook, possibly read by Morgan, almost certainly read by Morgan. Have we actually asked Morgan yet? But, uh, I have he... uh, drafted an email. I'll be pressing send later on today. Go, well, well that, that'll be, uh, he's, always, he's, he's, he's a very helpful man. He'll be able to read that first and uh, we'll get that done. And then obviously you get the hardback or you can also hear Brent. Brent, why not do both? Hear Brendan do the audiobook as well, uh, which is genuinely, I'm surprised how many people actually read the book and then they like, people like doing it a second time where they listen to the audiobook, um, oh, which is, uh, I mean, God bless you for doing that for all of us. <laughs> but um, you're keeping all these dogs in, in dog food. God love you. Um, <laughs> I think we've covered everything, my love. So all to say is thank you very much, all of you, for coming. This will be available on YouTube and, and Facebook and all that, so you can all see it. And uh, there'll be an email, by the way, in the next couple of days, possibly not tomorrow, because I'm tomorrow I'm going to Sheffield and Leeds, uh, the Book Bolton, Barnsley, um, and then hopefully Preston, Bolton, and possibly Oldham as well, uh, just to sign some books if you run in and out. Uh, by the way, just quickly, if you've got um, if you pre order from any internet place, if you've got a local bookshop, you can possibly use them from bookshop.org, but also if you want to just ask them to pre order, order it in. We'll send, if you want, get, even just tell them to email us or email us yourself, we'll send them the newspapers and a few more besides because we're very keen to support indie bookshops where we can. So do just tell them to drop us a line and we'll send them some papers and some signed book plates and stuff because um, I know indie bookshops appreciate that and we'll be delighted to do all that. Um, outside of that, thank you, Brennan, for coming. Um, thank Pleasure you, Wonder Boys, for putting up with me. Not just thank you so much. And uh, thank, thank you, you to all, all of our wonderful... Uh, but you've coming in. I hope you enjoyed this. We might do it again next year if you did. Um, and if we've, I think we've covered everything. So unless you've got anything you'd like to throw in, Elaine, I think we can call it. No, night. Just, just lots of thanks. Thanks for joining us. And I hope you all have a lovely evening. And I'm going downstairs to get stuck into that cider. Um, well, thanks, for folks. <laughs> friend, we'll thank see you, you soon, my friend. Everyone else, thank Bye, you very everyone. much. Good night. Bye. Bye.